of a year. As Shay Adam knows better than anybody, anything can happen, really. But uh, the good news is the hurricane has moved out uh, and we should be in for, uh, I think, most, mostly fine weather during the day. So I'm super excited. It's a great event. It's going to be a really tough race, though, for all of these teams and drivers. Cher Adam, give us some of the storylines. Let's start in GT Daytona, the GT3 cars. As ever, super close in qualifying. Uh, what are you hearing from the paddock about this race? Uh, well, first and foremost, we should mention that Bill Oberlin is not participating in the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring this year. He did test negative for COVID-19, but he was within close proximity to someone who tested positive. So he elected to sit this one out. Filling in for him is Nick Yellily, a man who has never driven around Sebring International Raceway prior to night practice on Thursday. He did set the fifth fastest time during that night practice too, by the way, and saw the track for the first time today during the daylight in the morning warm-up session. So, Bill, we miss you, and we want to see you back at the track soon. In terms of the other storylines in GTV, though, pole position for Jan Halen and the Wright Motorsport Porsche trying to go for the championship. They come into this race second in points and are looking for a strong finish in order to try and jump ahead of that number 86 Meyer Shank Racing Acura. At IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us uh, around the world uh, on RS2 is the home of IMSA Radio and Audio. We're in sound and vision for those of you outside the US. If you're in the US, of course, it's NBCSN, Lee Diffie leading the team. Also, if you're in the US and travelling around Sirius 202 and XM217, we're on the PA at, at Sebring International Raceway and on WWOJ 99.1 FM. So there's no excuse. Uh, not to be tuned in and uh, and listening uh, to us or indeed watching us. For those international viewers, we will be sound and vision without break uh, and interruption all the way through the next 12 hours or so. At the front of the field, Acura Team Penske, their final outing and in with a real big shout of the championship on pole position and sharing pole position, the team with whom they are battling for the overall championship. Conningham and the Cadillac, ironically, they will be an a, Acura team next year and even more interesting, Renge van, Renge van der Zander, who will start this car, hasn't got a drive for next year and he could be the driver's champion. Row two, the second of the Acura Team Penske's the number six car will be started by Dan Cameron with Sebastian Bourdais uh, is uh, listening, uh, is uh, starting the Mustang sampling Cadillac. Mazda Motorsports, this is the last time we'll see two of their cars uh, in a race together. Harry Tinknell starts the 55 uh, in position six. People to Rani, outside chance of the championship for the Willard Engineering Racing Red and White number 31 Cadillac. They have to win this race to be in with a chance, but they've got a great record here on the bumps at Sebring International Raceway. Ollie Jarvis is the second of the Mazda Motorsports DPIs, the number 77 car in seventh position. Ooh, three sevens there. That might be a portent of some fortune there. And Ollie Jarvis will be teamed up with Harry Tinknell next year in the Singleton entry. The top eight made up by JDC Miller Motorsports for the number 85 Cadillac. Then it's the P2s, the GTLMs and the GTDs. Four classes, one race, 12 hours. Great flag, great start. And we are racing for the final time in IMSA in 2020. And down in the first corner, Ricky Taylor jumps out into the lead down on the inside, turning hard left and sprinting through that short shoot between turns one, two and then into three. That looked like there might have been a little bit of a move at the start. That will be being looked at by the number 10 Cadillac as there was a bit of a, an early move there by Renga van der Zander. We'll keep an eye on that. Taylor van der Zander, Cameron Borde in GT Le Mans Corvette. Leads Connor De Filippi and BMW, then Jesse Kron, then Tom Milner as the GT Le Mans cars go through. And we already have a penalty for a violation building up to rolling off on the formation lap. Shea Adam, our VP Racing Fuels, Pit and Paddock reporter, has the details. You're allowed to change away from your qualifying tires, but it has to be within a certain window and definitely not within 30 minutes before the race. Well, Magnus, GRT, has a drive through penalty because they changed their tires after the pre-race deadline. Oops. That will be a drive through for that. Start is under review, standard operational procedure, but there was moving out of line 
by Renger van der Zander. Will he get away with that? Jeremy Shaw, exactly what the doctor ordered, as uh, so long as the doctor is Dr Penske, of course, for Ricky Taylor from Paul. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's what the, that team uh, wants to do. I mean, they already lead the championship. Uh, and uh, what way better way to defend that or go on to clinch it than winning a race? Uh, they've had the fastest car in the uh, qualifying session. Uh, they should be looking good for the race. I mean, that has been, they just had a fantastic uh, end of this season, a dismal start to it. They finished eighth, eighth, and seventh in the first three races of the season. Uh, but since then, it's been a completely different story. We uh, four of the last five races and second in the other one. So that is why. Elio Castroneves and Ricky Taylor lead the points, and that is why they're re leading this race in the very, very early stages. It's a very good job that Nick Damon is not joining us on this broadcast. He's busy on the uh, the Bahrain broadcast uh, with uh, Johnny Palmer, but I'm sure he would have burst into a chorus of "It's not where you start, it's not how you start, it's how you finish." Um, if if he'd heard that, here comes the yeah, 44 down the pit lane. Uh, that is the Lamborghini from uh, GRT Magnus. Uh, and that is for the uh, changing of tyres early on. And that's going to drop that car way, way back. Already the leaders then through turn 10 and heading to turn number 11. And then the battle in the GT Le Mans category. And it's a new leader there, BMW Team RLL. Conor de Filippi in the red. BMW Team RLL MH GTE. And he's got ahead of Tonio Garcia, champions elect. Uh, have they now won the championship, Jeremy, by starting this race, uh, Garcia uh, and uh, and uh, and Taylor? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, they'd, uh, they'd already clinched it. They were 35 ahead uh, coming into this race, so uh, they actually didn't even need to start because uh, they've got way more wins than their sister car, Oliver Gavin and uh, Tommy Milner. So that was uh, with a 35-point lead, uh, that's how many points you get for a win. So they had actually already clinched it prior to this weekend. Uh, ditto for the number three team, the team's championship. Uh, the uh, manufacturer's championship uh, also has been clinched by Chevrolet. It's Jeremy Shaw as we've got some side-by-side -side action on the Alec Ullman straight away at the LMP2 battles going through. Uh, and that uh, is, uh, was a, a, a wonderful run, by the way, again for Patrick Kelly uh, in qualifying. And I think that was uh, John Ferrano going past. Yes, it was. Naveen Rao, who was very impressive in his first outing uh, in the car this week, stepping up to LMP2, Jeremy, and qualified the Inter Europol competition number 51 very well indeed. Yeah, uh, Naveen, I mean, he really did, uh, he, he's improved his driving. He hasn't been driving for that long. Uh, but uh, he's, he's just got better and better and better the last few years, being coached very, very expertly by Matt Bell. Uh, won this year's uh, Prototype Challenge Championship. Very impressive. He had a couple of pole positions in there. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's a proper driver now. He's not just a, a, a you know, gentleman driver out there having some fun. Uh, and that's reflected the fact here he is in his first you know, proper top-line race. And uh, you know, he's really doing a nice job as well in that uh, number, uh, number 51 team. Uh, hello to Phil, to Andy and Aylin, uh, with uh, Gotham the Cat, to Flank Plasmans in the Netherlands, and everyone else who's tuned in around the world. Sound and vision from IMSA Radio and IMSA TV, WWOJ 99.1, uh, around the environs of the circuit in Central Florida, and of course across the US on Sirius 202, XM 217, RS2, around the world without block or break. Good to have your company. It's Jeremy Shaw, who you've just heard, and me, John Heindorf, in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Our pit and paddock reporter is our VP Racing Fuels reporter, Shea Adam. Uh, and Shea, a good start by everyone concerned, particularly at the front of GT Daytona. Jan Halen out front for Wright Motorsports. What a season they've had, and they've stealthed their way in some, in some respects in the championship contention. Yes, they very much have. Sorry, John, I've just gotten a notification of a penalty that's coming through. I'll touch on that in a moment. But as far as the 16 Ride Motorsport Porsche is concerned, they've only been on the podium three times, but they had a remarkable run of races all the way from Sebring in July, where they finished in the top five in positions. Their worst finish of the season comes at Sebring in July, when they finished ninth in that race. 
but that was also an opportunity to give Ryan Hardwick a bunch more driving time because they saw that they weren't going to come away with the possibility for a win. They have done a lot of testing at Sebring at Bright Motorsports, and they are very much focused on this race. Now, my loud uh, explanation there was because if you follow IMSA as a full umbrella championship, you would have paid attention in the Lamborghini Super Trofeo Series, where at Road America in the second round of the championship, a penalty was issued to Brian Sellers because he changed columns prior to the start line. That was a drive-through penalty. Well, it was, but at that point in time, it was a five-second penalty that was issued, long story short. But in any case, today, Ranger Van Der sees the green flag. He moves before the green flag and dives into the column behind Ricky Taylor. That should have been a penalty. And indeed, it has been assessed, a drive-through penalty for car number 10. This is massive. They are not only going for the four-hour win, but the overall win and the championship. And now their day has got a little bit harder. So basically pulling out of line and changing out of your start line, which would have been the outside ball for the 10 car before the start line. Green flag comes out and it, it, you can't change your lane. Think about it as that if you were on the highway. And if you change your lane before the start line. So green flag comes out. Yes, you're racing. But before the line, he drops immediately over to the left-hand side to get a little bit of the draft from Ricky Taylor and also to block off Dan Cameron from getting up the inside into turn wrong. That's a no-no. That's a drive-through. And that, if we think back to our Porsche keys to the race, no mistakes. You really can't afford to make mistakes even in these longer races. You've got to be there as we get into the darkness period. Uh, and you've got to look after the car through the traffic. We'll keep it, our eyes on those Porsche keys to the race throughout this one. Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to be critical of the, of the stewards here because that is the rule, so you know, that's fair enough. But if you look, uh, if the picture we saw is a very, very, very early start by Ricky Taylor. I'm sure way earlier than he was supposed to go. Uh, and the, the whole field was strung out that stage. Everybody was pretty much nose, you know, nose to tail. So why they would just single out and never take out, I'm really not quite sure. Uh, I think that's a... a, a for, for a 12-hour race to throw a penalty like that at the start, yeah, not really quite sure why they, they thought that was necessary. It wasn't as if anything dangerous happened, for goodness sake. So, um, yeah, curious one, that. But, uh, yeah, by the, by the letter of the law, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and, and I... I, I, I by the spirit, I, I'm not so sure. I think the thing that they were probably looking at was the block on the the, the second row Acura, because he pulled in, into the gap between the two Acuras and blocked them off before the start line. Um, one thing we have noticed about uh, the number 10 car, which peels right-handed into the pits, and Renger van der Zander in that number 10 car. My goodness, he gets close to the right-hand side at the apex of turn 17 on the pumps. I've not seen anybody else closer there. It is very bumpy through turn 17. There are huge concrete blocks that date back to the early 1940s when this was Hendrik Field and churning uh, air crew for World War II to go and see action uh, over in uh, in Europe on the B-17 Flying Fortress uh, and the B-24 Liberators. Uh, and uh, they have settled, I think it's fair to say, down through the years, Jeremy, but they're exceedingly big, these blocks, exceedingly thick, exceedingly heavy, and those bumps down through the years, well, they ch in fact, they change from year to year, don't they? Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, move they do not. <laughs> uh, yeah, th but uh, yeah, yeah, the, the character, the character of the place is very much uh, the same as it always was. But yeah, there's little nuances that do change, uh, definitely from from year to year. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's just something you've got to accept. You know, it's as if it's as if you're driving a kind of on a wet track in some ways, uh, because uh, every lap you, you, you go around here seems a little bit different. So early running then, let's give you the rundown in the classes. Uh, at the start of the race, Patrick Kelly got away in LMP2 uh, and has put a little bit of a, a lead. Say again, Jeremy? To the tune of 20 seconds. Uh, yes, uh, he's, he's, found the, uh, he's found the shortcut around. He's only doing two and a quarter miles to everybody's 3.75. I'm only kidding there. Of course, John Ferrano settles into second place in the Tower Motorsports by Starworks. And he started fourth in that class, so he's he's got by Don Yount. Uh, and what's happened to the other car in uh, in that category? That has uh, that has dropped away uh, for Naveen Rao. He's dropped all the way to the back for the Inter-Europol and 
has already been down the pit lane, Shay. Yeah, he made a quick trip down the pit lane. Uh, the total time was a minute and nine seconds. So that to me says a splash of fuel and new tires. Okay, um, not sure why they would want to do that early on unless there was something that they weren't happy with on the tires on which they qualified. Uh, Renga van der Zander has rejoined, but has dropped down to ninth position after that drive through for an improper start procedure. Uh, in the uh, GT Le Mans field, we documented Conor de Philippe getting to the front shortly after the start. He's 11th overall and leads GT Le Mans for BMW Team RLL. The number 25, the red car, uh, is ahead of the yellow one, which is the uh, Antonio Garcia-driven Corvette. About three quarters of a second. They've just gone through the start-finish line. Yes, Cron is third for the second of the BMWs, the white one, the number 24. Then Nick Tandy has the Stars and Stripes 911 in the final outing for the Porsche GT team in GT Le Mans in IMSA for the foreseeable future. Uh, Tommy Milner has the dark grey and yellow number four at Corvette in fifth. And Neil Jarney has the... St uh, stripes and stars 912 with the red and white stripes down the side that's the sixth position in, G in GTLM in GT Daytona Jan Heerlen now leads Andrew Davis from Team Hardpoint by 2.9 seconds that's Porsche from Audi from two Lexus so 16 Porsche 30 Audi 12 and 14 the two Lexus and they're all split by about seven or eight seconds uh, then it's the GRT Grassel Racing Lamborghini back in the championship, the number 11. Then Robbie Forley, Turner Motorsport in the M6 GT3, number 96. That's your top six. And remember, no Bill Oberlin uh, this weekend. Bill doing the honourable uh, and very honest thing. What else would you expect from Bill Power? Uh, he had been in close contact with somebody with the virus. And although he tested negative, he did not want to risk with a, a long incubation time for the virus. Did not want to risk coming into the paddock. Uh, and his place in that car has been taken by Nick Yellily, the BMW Works driver who jetted in from the UK on Thursday evening and with a little help from the jet stream managed to get here about an hour or so earlier than he expected so he was out in night practice but only saw the Sebring International Raceway circuit for the first time in the daylight in morning warm-up this morning and he's yet to get in that car of course as Robbie qualified it still 11 and 3 quarter hours to go the opening salvo salvos have been fired uh, and Jeremy Shaw we've got Acura, Mazda, Cadillac all at the front of the field separated by just under 6 seconds for Dan Cameron, Harry Tinknell and Sebastian Bourdais time now to settle down and start reeling off some laps yeah, and uh, Ricky Taylor's just done that. He's just set the fastest lap of the race uh, uh, at a 148.683 for our race leader. The lap record, the race lap record here, by the way, is 147.472. So uh, yeah, pretty good uh, lap times uh, right off the bat here for Ricky Taylor. He's already put a couple of seconds between himself and his teammate, Dane Cameron. But number, number, number 10 car, of course, out of the way now. Uh, it's just moved past uh, Patrick Kelly. Uh, into the eighth position, uh, but a full 30 seconds behind the race leader for Renga van der Zander. In LMP2, Patrick Kelly did notice he just put a lap on uh, Naveen Rao in number 51 car, so out of the pits, having made that stop, but already a lap down to Patrick Kelly, who's absolutely flying. He just set, reset his fastest lap as well at a 153.1, uh, and he's now 25 seconds clear, 26 seconds clear of John Ferrano in second place. Uh, no, other, no other real surprises. Other than uh, perhaps the uh, number four and number nine, twelve uh, GTLM cars both slipping back a bit. Tommy Milner is already a couple and a half seconds behind uh, Jesse Crone and Nick Tandy, already four seconds behind Conde Felipe, who's taking the lead actually from Antonio Garcia. Um, so they've sort of spread out a bit, and, and Neil Jarni is still getting used to, to the GTLM cars, and he's slipping back. He's about already four seconds or more behind Tommy Milner. The battle going on at uh, turn 10 as the a couple of Cadillacs formerly team cars of course but the Mustang sampling and the Whaling cars now run by different organisations Sebastian Bordier in the Mustang sampling red and white number uh, sorry dark grey number 5 and people to Rani in the 31 the red and white Whaling car those two cars battling over uh, fourth and fifth position at the moment ahead of them by around about uh, 
two seconds, a little bit more. Uh, Harry Tinknell, and he's got uh, about four seconds to make up on Dave Cameron, who's got about a second and a half on his teammate Ricky Taylor. As traffic comes into play, one of our Porsche keys to the race in the Michelin Countdown to Green earlier on. Another one, Shea, was be there in the darkness. Uh, normally, when we talk about the darkness and, and particularly set up for the cars uh, in the darkness, we talk about the temperatures dropping here when we are in March. Uh, which is the normal time for the Mobile One 12 hours uh, of Sebring. There are still some little vagaries to set up that might make a difference, and one or two of the teams are looking already 11 and a half, or actually it won't be that, will it? About eight hours uh, down the road until the sun starts to set. That is completely true, John, and particularly in that GTLM category, as the 48 Formula Race in Lamborghini comes down the pit lane to visit me. Uh, that's going to be a four-hour related pit stop because they're racing at the four-hour mark. But in terms of racing for darkness, do not expect to see either of the Porsches or the Ford Corvette necessarily leading the way while the sun is still up. Those cars in particular have been specially set up to be good when the sun isn't shining. So right. that's when the race is won, that's when the championships are won, and that's when those cars are going to pounce. Uh, no championship aspirations uh, for the GT Le Mans Porsches because uh, of them uh, missing uh, VIR, of course, after the problems uh, with COVID uh, spreading through the paddock uh, in Europe after, after Le Mans, Jeremy. Um, but uh, this is their last race. They want to go out on a bang. They want to prove to everybody that they have still got the pace and that the Porsche uh, standards can be, can be held high. Yeah, very, very true, John. Absolutely right. Because uh, yeah, they, they missed the race at Charlotte uh, uh, a few races ago, Charlotte, a couple of months sorry, ago. Yes. But uh, but uh, but other than that, you know, they, they've been omnipresent in all of the uh, GTLM races since the formation of what is now the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship in 2014. This will be the 76th race, uh, and because they missed that that round, the, the only drivers that have actually competed in in every single race in GTLM. Uh, Antonio Garcia, Oliver Gavin, and John Edwards uh, each have 75 starts coming into this weekend. Incidentally, uh, over the, the, the most number of starts by anyone in this championship is Andy Lally, who also is the only driver to compete in every GTD race. Uh, you know, there's different numbers of GTD, GTLM, LMP2, and DPI races during the season, so that explains that discrepancy. A couple of little notes. I'm surprised number 48 car coming, coming in that soon. Uh, yeah, even if you're looking at four hours, we're only t not even 20 minutes into the race, so that seems a bit odd to coming in to be coming in that early, from my perspective. Uh, uh, and also, well, particularly Jeremy on that, uh, because that all that thinking could be interrupted by a safety car after two and a half hours. That's what I'm saying. Or, or, or yeah, I mean, if it comes out, yeah, within the next uh, few, yeah, next little while, then fine, you know, it might play in their favour, but it seems to be an awful long way. Uh, ahead to be planning that, but uh, maybe they are planning on, on there being a portion within the first uh, 40, 45 minutes or so in the race, which I guess that, will, that might play, play out in their favour. Still a slightly strange one, then I think. Uh, but also, um, you know, I mean, four hours, you know, four hours, that's a time, time and a half, if you like, in terms of old leg, you know, <laughs> in terms of uh, next to It's Jeremy Shaw in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre with me, John Hindoff. Hello to Dave Alcock uh, and Ian McCarthy. And Dave Alcock noticing just how bumpy the Apex is on turn 17. Hello, Dave. Uh, they look to be bouncing even more than last year. Will the team managers be telling their drivers to stay away uh, from the inside of the corner to avoid excessive wear and tear on suspension and tyres this early uh, in the race? It's a fair point, Dave, because we have seen in some of the Challenge Series, uh, we mentioned the Lamborghini effectively getting a tyre bead pulled off the rim there uh, yesterday during the, the second of the, the Lamborghini Super Trofeo races. And in the Mission and Pilot Challenge, Shea Adam, we did have a shock absorber break close to the end of the race that took somebody out of a uh, out of a podium position that was the road shagger Audi wasn't it yes it was uh, we saw a lot of white smoke coming out of the side of that car we thought it might have been a tire issue but it was the front right shock housing that snapped clean in half when was the last time you ever yeah. heard of that happening on an Audi yeah absolutely Welcome to Sebring. hashtag respect the bumps even in November and you just can't 
take this place for granted. Insanely quick in places and getting quicker. Tire technology down through the years, and Michelin have done such a fantastic job since they came into the series. We were talking about it in the earlier broadcasts, Jeremy, just how fast some of these corners are now. And even for the GT cars, you've, you've got to have a really big performance advantage to make a pass at, at turn one now, because it, there's actually very little slowing down going on there. Super commitment left-hander at the start of the lap. Yeah, I mean, that's always been a super fast corner, uh, turn one, but you're right, with the technology that they have nowadays, it's, it's certainly a lot easier to take it flat out than it used to be in the old days when everything was perhaps even more on the edge. But, you know, the, it's uh, it's just a great racetrack from, from that perspective. There's so many, such a great variety of corners here, uh, and all of them uh, you have to kind of handle in different ways, if you like. And, you know, for the, for the uh, suspension engineers, uh, then it's, it's particularly challenging here, and shock absorber programs are they've always been important uh, i think the, the importance has been more recognized in recent years certainly or you know, over the last 15 20 years certainly but uh, you know that is a crucial aspect of setting these cars up for this racetrack uh, and jake wilson among a number who tweeted us at imsa radio and to remind us that it, it was neither Virginia or indeed Charlotte that Porsche uh, missed, although they had a nightmare race at Charlotte, finishing fifth and sixth. It was mid high Ohio uh, that the uh, the Porsche team uh, didn't get to. Yeah, I know. I know. I had I had the picture of the circuit in my mind. I knew it was rolling countryside, uh, but I got uh, the one that they probably wished they'd missed Charlotte after the uh, the result that they they got there. Uh, we're moving into uh, just over, or just on 40, uh, 20 minutes rather, of this uh, race having been completed. Good to have your company wherever you are, are in the world. It's the IMSA Radio and IMSA TV team together for the final time uh, this season. The 68th annual Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring will go right to the end. Uh, it's a uh, little bit uh, more difficult I know for you guys to follow over in Europe what is it half past three in the afternoon in the UK just after our later in Europe lots of motorsport this weekend we know that so if you uh, have chosen to be with us we thank you very much indeed great action already early on GT Daytona Jan Hill and leads for right motorsport to the Porsche ahead of team hard points Audi and Andrew Davis then Frank Monte Calvo for the first of the Ian Vassar Sullivan Lexus Aaron Tielitz, his teammate about four seconds further back then it is Richard Highstand for GRT Grasser racing team for the Lamborghini Huracan the number 11 and then Robbie Foley making up the top six for Turner Motorsport. Then the Ferrari of Cooper McNeil, Shinji Mishimi for Mershank Racing with Acura. Uh, not going to be uh, in the GT Daytona ranks next year at Shea Adam Mershank Racing. They're getting uh, one of the Acura prototypes, but their car uh, has, uh, one of their cars has already been picked up by Gradient Racing. That story breaking uh, this week uh, as well. So we will still have Acura's, in fact, it might well be Acura's a go-go in GTD next year. <laughs> well, we said we were gonna talk some rumors and yes, uh, from what I'm hearing, there are going to be a lot of the Acura NSX GT3s running around in GTD for the 2021 season having that gradient team pick up the second car, but there's no guarantee that they're actually going to run the second car yet. It might just become a parts situation. Uh, that is to be determined, but we are still gaining one, two, three, four, potentially five actors to the class, wow. even though we're losing two of them. So it's going to be a very, very different looking season, but also- Is that, is that are they going, are they sort of defecting from other manufacturers there, Shea, or are some of those going to be new entries? No, no, no. All of these are uh, manufacturer changes, okay. as far as I've heard so far. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that there is this sort of a flow that it might seem like a random situation. But when a manufacturer wins a championship, particularly in a customer-based entry, there does seem to be an influx of people buying that brand of car. It happened with Lamborghini a couple of years ago. We had one in 2018 and then five at the Rolex in 2019. So this sort of swing does happen. And for Acura, they've had two seasons in a row now where they've won the Drivers' Championship. That's a pretty good advertising for people who want to play the same. Across the line, the GT Le Mans battle. Porsche 
versus Corvette. That's Nick Tandy and Tom Milner. Where will Nick Tandy be next year with uh, no Porsche GT program here in the US? And uh, ruled out by Pascal Zulinden when we spoke to him oh, many months ago now about those cars going into private hands, uh, certainly in the short to medium term. But we still wait. Uh, and I hear that we'll probably find something out by the end of the month about Porsche and their potential prototype project in DPI 2.0, as we've been calling it, LMDH, whatever it's going to be called, it doesn't really matter. But the next generation of prototypes, Porsche very, very interested in getting back to the sharp end of the field and winning races overall, uh, both here in IMSA and across uh, in Europe and globally. And the talks that have been going on behind the scenes between major manufacturers to uh, try and strengthen that new category. Very interesting. When was the last time that Porsche and Ferrari were on the same side uh, of a motorsport argument? But, you know, strange times, strange bedfellows make. And there seems to be at least some understanding between Porsche and Ferrari. And Porsche certainly wanting to get Ferrari to commit as well. And if that happened, Jeremy, I, I think that would open the floodgates for that new LM. DH with two big names like that committing to it. We've already got good manufacturers here in DPI, many of whom have, have expressed a, a great interest in the new LMDH DPI 2.0 regulations. But Porsche and Ferrari coming in, that, that would, I think, cement that new category. It certainly is a mouth-watering prospect, isn't it? No question about that. And, uh, you know, I think certainly uh, the, the WEC needs a fairly major injection of, uh, of interest because it doesn't have much at the moment so that would be great and hopefully there will be a lot of spillage over here into the uh, DPI uh, 2.0 as well as you say well of course that's the, the draw of that, that's a single global category so you can go and race at Le Mans or win the WEC and you can come and win at Sebring overall and at the Rolex Daytona and that multiple team of them on, etc., 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 and that's got to be the right way to go in, in my mind, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, completely agree with you. Uh, and uh, you know, I think you know, there's been a lot of discussions, has there not, over the, over the course of the last year or so now, and you know, things are beginning to crystallise. And you know, I think lots of interest. We've, we've heard from quite a few different manufacturers who have expressed some level of interest. Uh, not yet any firm commitments, but uh, you know, in these times, one wouldn't expect that, I suppose. So half an hour has gone. This is how it stands. Let's give you the update uh, here at the 68th annual Mobile 112 Hours of Sebring uh, on IMSA Radio and IMSA TV. Starting at the front of the field, Ricky Taylor leads by just on two seconds. Accurate Team Penske number seven from Dade Cameron and Accurate Team Penske number six. The white and tangerine cars then leading out. It's another three and a half seconds further back until we see Harry Tinknell crossing the line in the sole uh, red crystal number 55 Mazda he's got about two and a half seconds on Sebastian Bourdais in the dark grey number five Mustang uh, sampling racing with JDC Cadillac just uh, six tenths of a second people Durrani possibly a little bit frustrated he's dropped about eight seconds away from the leaders at the moment in the red and white number 31 wheel and Cadillac and he's got about five seconds between himself and Ollie Jarvis, who makes up the top six in the uh, in the crystal white, glacier white. It's not crystal right, I was wearing the first place in 77 Mazda Motorsports. Ollie Jarvis with Harry Tinknell next year in the Singleton Mazda entry. LMP2, Patrick Kelly has disappeared up the road uh, by 45 seconds on John Ferrano. So it's PR1 number 52. That's the silver and blue Origa from Tower Motorsports, the white, yellow and black car. And Don Yount is in third position, another eight seconds further back. Conor de Felipe leads GT Le Mans for the faster of the GT cars in the BMW M8. That's the red uh, number 25 car ahead of Antonio Garcia by seven tenths of a second. Garcia is close back in again in the bright yellow number three Corvette. Uh, and he's nine seconds ahead of Jesse Kron in the black number 20, uh, in the uh, uh, black number 24 uh, BMW team RLL M8. He's got two seconds on Nick Tandy in the stars 
and stripe blue, blue and white stars down the side of the 911 Porsche. Uh, Nick Tandy then in fourth position, six tenths of a second from Tom Milner in the dark rear and yellow number four Corvette, and then ten seconds further back, the white with red stripes down the flank. That's the 912, that's the stripes and stars Porsche 911 RSR 2019 model year. Jan Heerland for Wright Motorsports in the number 16, the teal blue car, has about 10 seconds now on Team Hard Points. Audi number 30, uh, Audi tyre service sponsored car in second. Frankie Montecalvo leads a pair of Im Vassar Sullivan Lexus 12 and 14. High stand still in. Uh, Richard Highstand still in fifth position for the Lamborghini number 11. That's the Grasser GRT team, Turner Motorsport, and their BMW for Robbie Foley in sixth position. Now, just a couple of seconds ahead of the Scuderia Corsa Ferrari, that's the white uh, car, the number 63. Uh, that's the WeatherTech sponsored car. Uh, and losing a couple of Porsches is not great news for GT Le Mans next year. But Sheer Adam, our VP, uh, Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter, strong rumours that Scuderia Corsa could be stepping up into GT Le Mans this year uh, with a Ferrari, and uh, that's that's not a car that they would be unfamiliar with. The force is very strong with those rumours, as a matter of fact. Uh, yes, and Cooper McNeil and Scuderia Corsa and WeatherTech Racing, as, as all three entities have proven in the past that they're not afraid to race in the professional category. They did it at Le Mans this year. And if the competition is two Corvettes, well, anybody would be intimidated by two Corvettes, but the odds are a lot better at winning some of these major races in the big category. And it's a little bit more prestigious when you can win it in the bigger categories. So I applaud that effort. And I think it really is a fantastic idea for more teams to step up and go into the GTLM category. If you can do it, why not? Cheer Adam, our VP Racing Field Pit and Paddock reporter. Plenty more to come through. The next 12 hours, we're going to try and get a few guests for you, as usual, into the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Over half an hour gone now. And Ricky Taylor, where does his future lie with the end of accurate Team Penske and their DPI programme? Uh, Team Penske, as part of the, the deal for them running these cars and developing these cars for Acura in the US, Jeremy, uh, they did have the caveat that they had the cars exclusively uh, for the opening seasons of these chassis being in existence. That's come to an end now, as has the contract uh, with Acura, but great to hear that those uh, Acuras, two Acuras, will con continue in DPI next year, albeit in different hands. Yeah, very much so. Uh, it, it is exciting because you know, the cars are good, the teams are good, uh, the driver lines will be good. It, you know, be, there'll be um, it, it, excellent news for the series. We're not losing the Acuras. The bad news is, I think there's, they're both running as single car teams. I think it would be much more uh, beneficial for everybody. I'd have thought if there, were a couple, if there was at least one of them running two cars. But uh, you know, one step at a time. And you know, these are difficult times out there right now. So uh, I think it's you know, totally understandable. And uh, I, I applaud. Uh, Acura for making sure that their, their their cars are still going to be remaining in this championship because for sure they will be competitive. Yeah, 2021, and you know we've had this conversation many times before. Uh, I, I'm very optimistic about 2021, but I don't think we should kid ourselves, Jeremy. Um, every, the lights are not just going to switch back on again uh, when we go back uh, to racing next year. We'll follow that theme later uh, in the broadcast at IMSA Radio if you want to contribute. Uh, pit stop share, Adam, for the top four in DPI, all heading your way. Oh, this is going to be fun. All right, so first into the pit lane was the number seven tractor Team Penske. They have the last pit box on the pit lane because they are the championship leaders, so they get the best shot back out of the pit lane. Following them in was second on the pit on the track, the number six Acura Team Penske, which has the last pit box on the pit lane for the prototypes because they are lowest placed in the championship. So they could not be more far spread apart. It was just fuel and tires for both of the Acuras. As far as the Mazda was concerned, the 55 came down the pit lane. Harry Tignall looks like he jumped out of that car. I didn't see who jumped in, but I would imagine it would be Ryan Hunter Ray getting in for this middle stint. Ringer Van der Zane back down the pit lane as well for fuel and tires for the Conoco Cadillac. And I believe he's staying aboard for a second stint. Is already back out and rolling. 
The number seven leaves the pit lane first, followed by the number six. Then the Mustang sampling Cadillac, a really good stop for Sebastian Bourdais and his crew as he stayed aboard the number five fuel and tires there as well. And it is kind of a slow stop for the number 10. But remember, the Conic Minolta Cadillac was way back on the field because of that drive through penalty for jumping the start or miss handling the start, I should say, not staying in the column. So that is still a really good amount of ground that they've made up to come into the pit lane in fifth position. And your instinct was absolutely right down there with that VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock report. It is uh, the only driver change there was Ryan hunter rear getting into the number 55. Uh, JDC Miller Motorsports. Mateus Leist, he, he didn't start that car, did he, Shit, or did he? Uh, yes, he did. Right, yes, OK, he did. so, yeah, that is the... That. Go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, well, yes, yes, he did. Uh, and the number 10 car didn't come into the pits in fifth position, just crossed the, the, the start-finish line in fifth position. He was running in eighth uh, and actually hadn't been making that much ground on the cars ahead of him. He had moved ahead of the... Uh, I think he'd only fallen behind Patrick Kelly in LMP2. But to Renga van der Zender, I was kind of surprised he didn't make up you know, some ground to close up on the, the cars at the tail end of the DPI pack, those being the uh, number uh, 77 uh, and 85 car. The gap was still around about uh, 12 seconds before he came in to make this first pit stop. This was scheduled pit stop. Tell what else is interesting is people did already staying out for at least one, possibly two extra laps. He did have a pretty clear lap last time around. He did a 149.2. That's barely a tenth of a second slower than his fastest lap of the race. So he might be looking for track position. Remember, he got caught uh, after the start, Jeremy, behind that number number five Mustang sampling car and uh, we thought having dropped nearly nine ten seconds behind the leaders he might be getting a bit frustrated because it seemed that car had a bit more performance but people that just couldn't exploit it uh, he is at the moment just coming through to the Jean de Bian Benz and he's got lots of real estate in front of him the next car ahead of him is the Magnus uh, 44 and that's in the middle of the Ullman straight at the moment so whilst everyone else has just come out in the traffic those leading cars it might just work out for the 31 car track position not as important here as in other places but it's always nice to play your own strategy and not have to worry about everybody else's Jeremy absolutely John and uh, and he's just turned his uh, a lap at a 149.2 uh, has uh, uh, Pipo Durrani, which is within a tenth of a second, he's in his fastest lap of the race. Uh, I think you know, he, he, the, the first sort of half dozen laps, he realised he wasn't going to find a way past Sebastian Bourdais, so he concentrated. That's the time most of this guy a spin there at uh, the extra turn 16. Correct. Uh, but uh, I think Pipo Durrani you know, and the team, they realised that you know, getting past Sebastian Bourdais kind of wasn't worth the, the effort slash risk. So let's just concentrate on saving as much fuel as we can. Go as long as we can. If we've got some clear track, then stay out there. That's exactly what he did. He's now on to pit lane on lap 21. Shea Adam is watching. The and tires only as Pipo does not want to get out of the race car yet. He loves Sebring and he loves driving around here, so he's going to stay aboard for another stint. We also had Oliver Jarvis in the pit lane for the 77 Mazda, and he too stayed aboard for another stint after taking on fuel and tires. Uh, at the tower car, by the way, uh, the number eight car, John Ferrado, who was in second, and John Don Young, by the way, has gone through for performance day. But John did get that car pointing back in the right direction, so fairly harmless spin in terms of damage coming out at turn 16, but it has cost him real estate. Now, has this paid out for wheel and engineering? There's a whole gaggle of cars coming down the front straight. Here come the Acuras, so he's going to drop in behind the two Acuras. I think he might have just jumped a position or two there uh, as he gets up to speed, staying in the car. Did Sebastian Bordier in the five get through? Oh, yes, he did. Yes, he did, so it hasn't quite worked. But I thought I think it was worth a, a roll of the dice there, Jeremy, early on, just to see if they could get the extra lap and a bit of extra pace. But I think he's dropped in back behind uh, uh, Sebastian uh, Bordet uh, again, to be honest. Yeah, that's frustrating for him, certainly. But look, you know, it's still you know, it's saving a couple of laps worth of fuel this stage of the race. That's, that's certainly... You know, a good position to be in, and that could play, pan out in their favour uh, before too long. Interesting, certainly, to see that one of the Acuras is that slowing. He's fallen behind the number five car. That's curious. That's number seven. That's the leader. He must have had a problem somewhere. That's, well, that's uh, literally just happened then. Yeah, exactly right, because uh, they came out, two Acuras came out of the pits, pretty much nose to tail with Ricky Taylor still ahead, Cameron. 
Tom's no puts it's up there in the, in the early part of this lap. Yeah. So the uh, the six car now leads Dean Cameron from Ricky Taylor, who's got now the number five of Sebastian Bourdier, the first of the Cadillacs, right up his tailpipes. Meantime, people, Durrani caught in traffic. He's got uh, uh, Ryan Hunter rear right, right with him. He's got Ollie Jarvis not too far back as well. Oh, no, there's a problem. Problem for the number seven. This has championship implications here. The seven is dropping like a stone at the moment. There's no forward power from that uh, number seven car. It's already dropped behind both of the Mazdas. This is massive, massive Jeremy Shaw for the championship. Massive for this race too, as the seven car, I think, with Ricky Taylor aboard, will peel off into the pits this time, unless they can find a quick uh, fix for that car. Surely he will come into the pit lane, and indeed does. This is huge. Barely 40 minutes into the 12 hours of Sebring and Shea Adam. Here's the drama starting right now. Ricky Taylor into the pit lane. Is he going to stop in his box or is he going straight behind the wall? The car language is saying he's coming into the box. Yes, indeed. They are going to do a splash of fuel before they do any other work to the car just to gain that one lap back. But the tail is coming off the car from what I can see. Uh, yes, the rear end plate will come off. They will then pull the engine cover off. Oh, this is going to be a substantial amount of work. Now, they have had issues in the past with hoses coming off the car, being bounced around Sebring International Raceway. But the engine is stopped, and this will be a lengthy pit stop. Now, Acura Team Penske has run in the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring with four cars in effect before. Twice they've DNF'd, once they have finished in the top five. They do not have a great record here at Sebring, and maybe Sebring is biting them once again. Jeremy, massive news for the overall championship here. This is the car that was going for the big prize. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, what a uh, so early in the race as well. It, everything was uh, was going to plan there, but clearly not here. Uh, discussing there with the pit lane steward. That's curious. Not quite sure why that would be, but uh, there certainly doesn't seem to be any sort of urgency there, does there, at that number seven pit. So this at yeah, the moment, some, something right. I think something drive drive train wise. Perhaps they're kind of rocking the car back and forth. Is he going to go uh, behind the wall here? Share Adam, what's going on? It's coming behind the wall, John. As a matter of fact, that's why they were talking to Johnny, not the lead pit lane official. It's driving back to the paddock at a rather good speed, actually making its way back to the garage area. Now, I did hear a report from Acura, and thanks to Dan Layton, that all that they know so far was that there was no turbo when they came back out of the pit lane, there was no boost. Very similar situation to what they experienced in July. They're hoping a clamp has gone loose, but they don't officially know yet. So they're gonna take back to the garage and look at it a little more closely. Yeah, I was going to say they'd had that problem uh, earlier on in the season. Was that here or was that somewhere where else, Shea? But they, they had, I mean, it, it was ju just literally a clamp and a hose that wasn't doing the clamping and the hosing, uh, and therefore they, they weren't getting the, the power boost that the turbocharger would normally give. That was here. Right, OK. Respect the bumps. Hashtag at Ibsa Radio. Thank you to Steve Fall, to... The Andy Pothole to everybody else uh, as well. Corey G, Bayou, Stuart Hart, uh, and uh, everyone else who's tweeting in with uh, very kind words of support for the whole team at IMSA and IMSA Radio. It has been a strange year, hasn't it, for all of our series that we cover here on the Radio Show Limited network of channels. But nice to know that you've supported us through the years. And that, by the way, is very, very much appreciated, both in event uh, when sometimes we don't have the time, as you might imagine, to get back to you. But Jeremy, Shea and myself, and indeed all of our, our uh, uh, commentary team, always catch up the day after the races, so we might be a little bit later, but we do see everything that comes in. So thank you for your support throughout this difficult year. And uh, it is much appreciated, and it's driven all of us on in 2020. The two Mazdas then, now running fourth and fifth. People to Rani with that issue for the championship contending number seven. Acura Team Penske prototype is up into third. Bordier to second and is three and a half seconds behind Dan Cameron, who leads. It's still BMW from Corvette from DM BMW in GT Le Mans. And uh, Porsche from 
Audi, from Lexus, from Lexus, from BMW, from Lamborghini, from Ferrari, from Acura, from Aston Martin and Mercedes hanging on to the top ten for Gar Robertson. Sheer Adam uh, down in the pit lane. Uh, we had a, an early pit stop uh, for the number 51 of Naveen Rao in the Europol. Uh, did we get to the bottom of that? Was that a penalty or a problem? No, no, it was fuel and tires. They took Naveen Rao off of the qualifying tires on which he had started. And actually now he's back up to second in class, but everybody is just chasing the, um, well, the idea of Patrick Kelly because he's <laughs> so far ahead of everyone. He's got more than a minute and 40 seconds now on second place. Um, but yes, it was just to get him off those tires and put a little bit more fuel in, just going a little bit off strategy. Very strange that they didn't elect to start Naveen on new tires, but Inter Europol making their second ever race in this series. It is a coordinated effort with PR1 Matheson Motorsports and with a lot of crew guys from Era Motorsports. Oh. So a lot of LMP2 love in that paddock. Uh, and hello to Cara de Flaming, who is uh, in the pit lane working with that team, has come across from Europe for this one. And uh, thank you for all her help, not just here, but for the whole season. Cara, an absolute legend in uh, sports car and racing paddocks around the world. Jeremy Shaw, uh, 45 minutes nearly completed and uh, pretty interesting so far. Yeah, indeed, and uh, it's uh, it's yeah, pretty strung out at the front. It's just a shame to see that uh, number seven car have a uh, apparently fairly major problem so early in this race. People are running now up into uh, third position, and he can't number 31. He's managed to get, to get past the number five car and actually pull away a little bit. Uh, so two miles is running, I think, pretty conservatively at this stage in the race. They're running together in the fourth and fifth positions. But Sebastian Bourdais, he's charging along there in mm. second position. He's just set his fastest lap of the race. He's now only three seconds behind the race leader, Dane Cameron. He's brought that gap down from, from five seconds after the round of pit stops. So this has a really, been a really good uh, run, a promising run, I think, for that Mustang sampling team because they've had a pretty disappointing season so far at least after the beginning of the year, which started out pretty well with a trio of podium finishes. Since then, it's been rather disappointing. So good to see that car running strong here in the early stages and in second place. In LMP2, Patrick Kelly, yes, he's just romping away. Naveen Rao then on that d different strategy. He'll be into the pits, I, I think, uh, pretty shortly for his uh, s second stop. Still odd to me that they would come in after, what, four or five laps or whatever it, whatever it was, uh, without there being some sort of a, a problem. I uh, don't quite understand that one. Uh, but uh, in GTD, the big surprise for me is how strung out the cars are in GTD. Jan Halen is just uh, disappearing in the in the lead there. He's, he's now got a gap of about uh, 14, 15 seconds over Andrew Davis. That's after kind of 20, what, 22 laps. So uh, he's been showing that same form that he showed in qualifying, translating into the race. We see another seven car. Uh, undergoing the major surgery there in the garage. New fastest lap of the race for Pippo Durrani in third position. Yeah, uh, 148.465. He's close within nine seconds now of second place. So that's 10, 11, 12, nearly 13 seconds away uh, from the lead. He came in at, at, at the start of the pit stop, should I say. He was just on nine seconds, just over nine seconds behind the leader. So that hasn't really worked out they give it a good go went a couple of laps uh, longer than the cars ahead of them but couldn't make up that time but what we do know is that they're getting a couple of laps better fuel mileage certainly early on it might be a little early jeremy to to start projecting forward because in the first stop of the race Traditionally, teams fairly conservative. There's been a couple of safety car laps that have been they've driven around to uh, the grid as well, and they're not going to push the envelope massively. Uh, but we have most of the teams did uh, 19 laps, 20 laps for the uh, Mazda number 77, 21 laps for the wheel and engineering Cadillac. But it's this stint that they're on at the moment that should give us some better data for fuel mileage. Yeah, yeah true, true, true that. Uh, and the, the, the two Mazdas, by the way, just swap, swap places. Oliver Jarvis in number 77 just got past Ryan Hunter Ray in the uh, number 55 car. So it's so running fourth and fifth, but now with the 77 car, about three and a half seconds behind Pippo Durrani, who 
uh, clearly took advantage of that nice clear track on that last lap. So uh, at the moment, the fastest lap of the race. It's Jeremy Shaw, who's with me, John Heindhoff, in a very socially distanced manner in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Been a brilliant season and thoroughly enjoyed everything. This is the last major race weekend for IMSA, WEC, ending their championship this weekend with the eight hours of bar in going on at the moment into the, well, I was going to say into the darkness at the Sakia circuit, but it's actually brighter than daylight there when they turn all the lights on. So much so, I think that when the, certainly when I used to go there, the endurance racing, they only used to put every third one on and it was still brighter than anywhere I'd ever seen. Uh, the uh, European Endurance Series, the SRO Championship, finishing off with a thousand K of... Uh, Paul Ricard this weekend, although that race is tomorrow, and and that uh, she has put a bit of a strain uh, on uh, some of the driving uh, pairings in all of those series, and so um, I, I dare say anybody who has an international license uh, has probably had a call this weekend to go and race somewhere. Yeah, well, your phone rang, didn't it? Yeah, it did several times. And the responsible yeah, adult wouldn't adults, uh, no. wouldn't let me. No, wouldn't no, let me go. No. Um, well, we've got two notable ones in this paddock. In the 31, Philippe Albuquerque is normally the endurance driver with Pippo Durrani and Felipe Nazar, but he's on WEC duty with United Autosports, so he can't be here, meaning Gabby Chavez has been drafted in for that team for this weekend. And the other one that was a really big and um, pleasant surprise, I'll say, we got Joey Hand back in IMSA, and believe me, the smile on my face is huge. She had driven a race car since last October when the Ford GT program came to a close. So we have Joey Hand in the 57 Heinrich Racing Acura, because Alvaro Parent is off racing in, what did you say, Portugal, was it? Uh, the Algarve? Uh, For um, some GT... No, he's, he's racing at Ricard. Yeah. Uh, Ricard. Paul Ricard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In France, sorry. Got yeah. my uh, my country slightly mixed up there. Um, but yes, Alvaro can't be with us this weekend. Oh. As, uh, But Joey Ann, welcome back to IMSA. Uh, we've got Debris out on the circuit, and it's, uh, it's from... Uh, one of the P2 cars, it's the number eight tower racing by Starworks, very much home ground for Peter Barron and the Starworks team. Uh, and left front damage, there's been contact there and part of the inner arch liner is on the circuit. Not sure that will be able to stay there. In the meantime, we are keeping an eye on what's going on in the paddock and uh, what looked to be a a uh, turbo unit uh, from the number seven car was being replaced uh, and it was the uh, John Ferrano in the number eight car was trying to get out of the way of I think the leader of the race at turn 17 uh, in impossible hope of a full course yellow we have got some GTD and some GT Le Mans takers down the pit lane with Shea Adam we have Ryan Hardwick climbing aboard the Wright Motorsport Porsche, taking over from Jan Halen, who started the race and pretty much cleared out. That was the main pit stopper in terms of GTD. In GTLM, we've got Jesse Krohn in the 24 BMW, Tommy Milner in the Ford Corvette, and Neil Yanni in the 912 Porsche. All of those cars in. It looks like it's only a fuel and tire stop for the Corvette. Might be driver changes for the Porsche. Uh, also into the pit lane now, we've got the 12 Lexus from Ambassador Sullivan. That's Frank Montecalvo brought it in. There was a driver change there. I think it is Michael Lee Casada taking over, but I'll have to let you know at the beam when they get out. Also, in, we've got the 86, which is Meyer Shank Racing Actress. Shitty Machini started that car. Richard Highstand in the number 11 Grasser Racing Lamborghini. And Ian James in the 23 Aston Martin for Heart of Racing. Uh, Jesse Cron back out in the 24 BMW. Tommy Milner stayed aboard the Corvette. They're back into the fray as well. Still under green flag at the moment. Coming down to the first full hour of racing completed. And Dan Cameron still leading, but Sebastian Baudet has made the best of the traffic and his pace has been stunning. 48-8 last time uh, around Jeremy and that was his best lap of the race and he's right there with the leader. Yeah, indeed so, you know, that gap had been coming down sort of uh, you know, gradually whittling away uh, is Sebastian Baudet on that lead for Dane Cameron. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure the uh, Dane Cameron 
uh, Acura team, they, they, they'd be pretty conservative right now. You know, we're still in the first hour of the race. The other cars already had a problem, so they're not going to push as hard uh, as they perhaps might have liked to. Uh, and I don't think Dane Cameron will be terribly comfortable seeing someone like the experience uh, of Sebastian Bourdais right behind him. But this is going to be an intriguing battle. Certainly great to see this Mustang sampling car having such a good run here because it's been quite a while since we've seen that car really challenging at the front of the field. Looks from behind him, by the way, Patrick Kelly has just gone a lap down in the uh, leading LMP2 car. And while he was speaking there, Jeremy, full course yellow for that debris on the front straight. I think somebody has uh, clipped that car, that uh, piece of uh, debris, uh, and that is going to bring everybody in behind the safety car. Shear one or two got in, I think. Just before Robbie Foley, Aaron Tealitz, Andrew Davis, Nick Tandy all got in before the yellow was called. Yes, correct. And they are also on the pit lane receiving service, fuel and tires for the 14 Lexus. I think I saw Aaron Tealitz get out of that car. Turner Motorsports celebrating a win yesterday. They did have their Turner, Turner Taco. I was going to say Turner Taco Tuesday, but of course it was Friday. Uh, a little bit of a celebration, but looking to try and get another win. We also had the Magnus Racing GRT Lamborghini in. That was John Potter who brought it in. Spencer Pompelli who took it back out. And would you like an update on the 7, by the way? I would indeed, yeah. All right. Um, it was a left side intercooler that failed. They had to change it out, and to get to it, they had to remove the left side turbo. So that was the slightly strange shaped object that we might have seen a mechanic holding uh, haphazardly. Uh, yes. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, we're coming down to the first hour of racing having been completed. Uh, we would normally do an update uh, on that first uh, hour, but as we've got the safety car being deployed, let's do it just a couple of moments early. Uh, and here's how it stands then. Dan Cameron leads. For Acura Team Penske, everybody will get squished up behind the safety car now. Bordier, Mustang Sampling, number five, Cadillac in second. Wheel and Engineering, Cadillac, number 31, Peter Durrani in third. Oli Jarvis, 77, Mazda, that's the white and blue Mazda in fourth. The dark salt red crystal, 55 in fifth. Matthias Leist in sixth for JDC Miller Motorsports, Cadillac, number 85. And Ranga von der Zander still not really having recovered from that drive through, but at least we'll get the time back now and be back on the tail end of the rest of the DPIs in the Connacht Minolta Cadillac uh, when we go back to green. In GT Le Mans, BMW Team RLL 25 from Corvette number three, from Porsche number 911. That's your top three there. LMP2, Patrick Kelly, well ahead of the game for PR1, Matheson Motorsports, but I don't think he's put a lap uh, into, oh, you know, he might have. I'll have to check to see where they are when we shake out here, whether he's got a lap. I think he has got a lap on John Ferrano now in the Tower Motorsports car. Uh, and GT Daytona, Cooper McNeil now leads for Ferrari. Uh, uh, yet to stop, though, uh, with everyone else having stopped just uh, before the full course caution came out. That's just at the end of the first hour of racing and the first... And let's hope the first of very few interventions by the safety car with also the rapid response vehicle on the circuit to uh, recover debris from the left front wheel arch, the underpinnings of the wheel arch of the Tower Motorsport by Starworks car. That's how it stands, 11 hours ago.